Hello to you all and um, welcome to lesson eight on natural hazards. Um, I hope you're all getting on really well with the work. It looks as though uh, the colder weather has brought you all back inside and the quality of work has massively increased from some of you. Uh, huge well done to lots of you. I was very impressed with the work that I got on the tsunamis and it was quite good to see how some of you had actually looked at different ones as well, not just sort of thinking about the one that we've done with the Boxing Day tsunami but also with a lot more detail on the Japanese one, including some of you who managed to teach me bits of information that I didn't know. And that's fantastic. It's always great to actually find out something new. Um, and I think it was the part about the plates having a lot of clay underneath them. So apparently the plates slid really well. So thank you for that. Uh, as I said, always good to find out something new. So just to see what you can remember about volcanoes from last lesson, I want you to give yourself about 90 seconds. And during this time, I want you to draw the two different volcanoes that we studied last week. One of them is a shield volcano and the other one's a composite volcano. So in your drawings, try to annotate them and put as many different points and characteristics about them. Remember what type of plate margin they're on, so constructive or destructive and see whether you can remember whether they emit ash um, and or lava and their viscosity. Is it runny? Is it really explosive? Is it very thick? Uh, all the other characteristics. So put yourself on pause and give yourself 90 seconds. OK, so hopefully you didn't cheat. And I always know because I get some really good drawings sent through or uploaded onto Teams. So here's our two different ones, our composite at the top which is our sort of stereotypical type one. Uh, this is really huge amount of detail. So if you manage to even write down that it's got steep slopes above 10 degrees, I know you cheated if you sent me that as an image because that's the first time you've seen that bit of information. Uh, but if you have a look, you can see the sort of height that's et cetera that is there. Uh, and if you look at the bottom one, the shield volcano, you can see how much wider it is. So well done if you've got those points. OK, I thought we'd do something a little bit different as a starter today. Um, if you're able to, you can print this out and see whether you can locate where the world's most famous volcanoes are. If you can't, um, then I will see if I can attach this as a file for you. Or you can just sort of have a look and play around and see what you can find. So just as a reminder how to do it, we have got here Krakatoa. Now, I'm wondering whether you can remember what I told you about Krakatoa last week and this huge explosion in 1883 and the distance of where it, the sound of it was. So to be able to locate Krakatoa, we want to be six degrees south and we want to be 104 degrees east. Now, six degrees south means six degrees south of the equator. So the equator is zero. And anything above it is north and anything below it is south. And then we want to be 104 degrees east. Now, the line, the Greenwich Meridian line is our zero line. OK, and you can just see it running. It actually runs through London, hence its name Greenwich. Greenwich is a part in London and anything to the right of it is east and anything to the left of it is west. So in locating Krakatoa, we want to be six degrees south. So if we have a look here, if that is zero and that is 15, so zero is there and 15 is there, we're going to be just somewhere round about halfway. OK, my amazing drawing. It's 104 degrees east, so it's going to be 104 degrees if this is, uh, where are we? That is 90, 100 is there, and that one is, uh, what's that? That's 105 there, so it's going to be just over, and we would follow it up, so it's round about here. OK, and you would put a little circle there and mark on that that's where Krakatoa is. So if you want to have a go at some map skills and to be able to locate where they are, then go ahead and do that. 
something else for you to do as well i've attached a game of who wants to be a millionaire and it's got lots of questions on it to see whether you can beat the clock um in, or so beat the uh the questions you've got if you know the format of who wants to be a millionaire then you get four questions and you have to choose them and if you keep getting right i'm afraid i don't actually have a million pounds for you but have a go at it uh one thing i will say is i had a quick play around on it and what you have to be careful of is when you've selected your answer and if it tells you you're right it then tells you what sort of pretend money that you have got there's about a five second delay so just literally don't hit anything after five seconds the next question comes up if you get it wrong you can go back to the beginning and see how many sort of points you can actually end up getting before you get it wrong and see how many of you get it right all the way through to the end so just something else that you might want to do to pass the time so today's lesson a bit unusual should i go or should i stay now and we're going to go through three learning objectives we're going to identify the causes of a volcanic eruption in a low-income country we're going to examine the effects of the volcanic eruption and we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of the responses so just a reminder how this fits into our topic as always we've done what makes natural hazards we've looked at the structure of the earth we've completed our work on seismic events of our earthquakes and tsunamis last lesson we looked at volcanic eruptions in general so we're going to look at our low income example and then we'll move on to our high income example um, and then we're going to think about living in hazardous areas so we're currently at this part here okay so we're going to use the example of the island of montserrat now some of this work might be a little bit familiar because we did do an example of this back in year seven so i'm not sure whether every class did it so some of it may be new some of it may be very familiar to you but we're going to use the island of montserrat and it had a volcanic eruption from a volcano known as chances peak and its range of hills it's on is the sofreya hills it is a low income country and to put things into context as well as to how small it is i'm comparing it to the uk so if we look at its population just 5373 people currently live on the island now you have to bear in mind about 8000 people left after the eruption although some of those have returned so if we look at that number let's bear in mind that bista has a population of about 35000 so it's about seven times smaller in population of bista its area is 102 square kilometers now the uk is just under a quarter of a million square kilometers so the uk is 2388 times bigger than uh, the island of montserrat now the reason it's going to be a low income country is you can look at lots of different factors as to uh, what makes it low income and one of the things is its life expectancy um, there are countries that have considerably lower. I think one of the lowest has just over 40 years for its life expectancy. I think that's Sierra Leone, but well, I think it has improved to into its 50s now. Uh, but to put it into context, that the average life expectancy is 75.3 years, and in the UK it's 81.1 years. Now, its GDP per capita is its gross domestic product per person. So it's an adding up. I think I talked about this when we were looking at New Zealand. It's adding up the value of all the goods and services in a country divided by its population. Now, it actually is higher than you would expect. And part of that is because of its low population anyway. Um, when you look at its sort of value of what the money that the country makes that it can spend, it, it ranks at nearly 200th in the world. And um, I think we were ninth in the world. So just to put it into a greater context there. And the percentage with access to the Internet, again, is often shown as wealth and how developed a country could be. Uh, just over half of that country has access to the internet. Now we're running, this data was four years old for the UK at just under 95%. I would imagine that that number has increased considerably even in the last four years. Now its infant mortality rate often gives us an indication as to how wealthy a country is because it gets you thinking about the medical care, the nutrition that's available for both uh, the expectant mother, then the newborn infant when they're born. And infant mortality rate is the number of children that sadly uh, don't survive, so they'll die before their first birthday. And it's based on per thousand children that are born, how many won't be there when they're one. Uh, and in Montserrat, it will be just over 11, whereas in the UK, it will be four. Now, what's very different is that these figures aren't always that comparable because in the UK, 
that number could be because of genetic um, uh, genetic conditions it could be because of a difficulty in the birth it could be because the baby's got some particular illness um, also it includes premature babies so some children in this country are born extremely prematurely and actually will survive for quite a few weeks whilst uh, the hospitals are doing the best uh, to keep them alive and then sadly may succumb to an infection or something whereas in a very very low income country they wouldn't even survive the birth so they wouldn't be counted in that. Um, in low income countries, the infant mortality rate is often things like the um, uh, poor nutrition. Whereas in the UK, if a baby died of poor nutrition, there would be a whole public inquiry and it, people could end up being prosecuted over it. So putting it into context and let's find out where this is. So I want you to describe. So I've just spotted that the top of the slides cut off slightly there. That should say describe the location of the island of Montserrat. So as always, when we're describing anything, we write a paragraph and make sure we're saying what continent it's in. So it's sometimes called Latin America because it's uh, between South America and North America. Uh, the latitude, is it north or south of the equator? Remember to name its surrounding oceans and seas and any countries and cities that it's nearby. Uh, in this instance, there aren't any cities because we're talking about an island, so I want the surrounding countries and use compass directions in your description. So for example, you would want to say uh, to the north, uh, it's got compass directions right to the northwest of Montserrat are the islands of St Kitts and Nevis. So that's what I mean about your incorporating compass directions. I would also maybe describe its location in relation to South America. Uh, and here, this is the USA, so that you're putting it into context. If you just name all of these tiny little islands that are nearby, then that might actually help you in terms of your understanding, unless you happen to be really good at geography and know all of those Caribbean islands. OK, so let's get a little bit further background information as to what Montserrat was actually like. And um, I won't read all of this through with you, but you've got an idea that basically in the early 1990s, there were about ten and a half thousand people, very, very sort of traditional type of island. Um, in the Caribbean, lots of sort of culture and history belong there. Uh, no large resorts, so although it was big for tourism, it wasn't the big sort of holiday resort. There weren't the modern clubs, there weren't the modern chain stores, just beautiful tropical beaches and jungle covered mountains and the Sofreya hot springs. But it wasn't perfect. Uh, it was too small to what's called self-sustaining. So the reason it relied on economic assistance from the UK is despite its location it actually was a British overseas territory so what would happen is back in the UK in Westminster where Parliament is they would allocate um, an elected sort of government but appoint a governor and the governor would oversee everything that goes on on the island and although it actually has links with sort of, you know, what we call our dark history time of slavery and imperialism, they were actually very proud of their British heritage. And that's really quite significant to understand that when we are looking at the context of where the help came from with Montserrat. So a little bit more here about its location here. You can see the island in a bit more detail and you can see that this here, Plymouth, is its capital. I can't really call it a capital city because it's, you know, with only a few thousand people on it, it's not really a city. And then you can see here, this is Chances Peak. And the next few slides have some photographs that just show what the area was like before the eruption. So you can see here how it's sort of carved into beautiful hills. And so it's tropical areas and lush vegetation. And this photograph here, I think it's absolutely amazing because the one on the left, this here is what the volcano Chancellor's Peak used to look like. And then after the eruption, this dashed line shows you the top, the force. There was so much energy that it blew away. And this is now the new shape of the volcano. And here's an image of the church in the capital Plymouth and 
how it looked afterwards. So that gives you an idea of how much of the city or the town, the capital, was completely covered in ash after the volcanic eruption. So we need to know well, what actually caused the volcanic eruption. So first of all, we just recap a little bit and think about what happened last week's lesson when we were talking about how two plates can be moving towards one another, the Caribbean plate in this instance, and North American plate. Now, the North American plate here is slowly moving towards the Caribbean plate. Now, what happens, the North American plate is more dense, and where it's more dense, it's, that means it's heavier, and it's subducted when underneath the Caribbean plate, and lots and lots of pressure built up, um, and eventually it erupted. Now, if you look, there's this chain. Now, these are called volcanic arcs because what happens is that over time these plates where they're subducting underneath will cause lots and lots of little eruptions and along a line they've created huge of the huge numbers of these um, where they've eventually gone above the surface of the sea and created islands so this hit group of islands are known as um, arcs and just to see what could potentially come out of a volcano, we mentioned this before, we have pyroclastic flows, um, lahars, which are your sort of mud flows in a way, you're very sort of, but they're very hot. And then you can have things where you have a, um, the, the ash can come out as well. So what we would expect and ash and lava. So these here, a quick guide of what you would expect. So just so you're aware of what happens. These are just photographs. So the pyroclastic flow months um, in the Philippines, the Lahar in Montserrat and the Lava Dome in Guatemala. They're just examples, but all of these could happen anywhere. So a timeline. So last week I mentioned to you that there were three types of volcanoes. Extinct, where they're never going to erupt again. Dormant, where they haven't really erupted for a very long time, but a thought to be potentially on their way to becoming extinct and active and active are ones that erupt quite frequently and Montserrat hadn't erupted for 350 years so pretty much nobody had really lived on the island um, that's one of the reasons why it got all its vegetation and we'll look in a few lessons time as to why people live in volcanoes but one of the things you need to understand is that all the ash that comes out of the volcano is really really fertile and so that's one of the reasons it's covered in this beautiful vegetation because all the rock minerals have come out through the eruption and have settled onto the soil, enriched the soil and lots of things grow. So people have settled on the island, living quite happily, tourism, but quite chilled back and laid back. And 350 years, there'd been no eruption. It was thought to be dormant. And then suddenly, in 1995, there were some eruptions. And what happened was to begin with in July, 1990, I can't speak, 1995, some ash and steam was being seen coming out of the volcano. It was coming to life. And a month later, there was this huge eruption where the ash, just ash came out and evacuated, uh, sorry, landed on Plymouth, covered it in Plymouth. So they evacuated. And then it went a little bit quiet for six months. Nothing really happened. And then in March of 1996, there were some plastic flows. Six months later, the dome collapsed. And a whole load of, you know, 500,000 tonnes of ash got released. Now, in this stage, people had been evacuated. If you actually have a look, at the map there you can see that the red area was completely evacuated there was no admittance so they moved everywhere there was this exclusion zone the central zone they basically said okay you can live in there but you're going to have to be on a constant state of alert you can be ready to be evacuated but you have to sort of walk around with dust masks and hard hats just in case and the yellow zone pretty much carried on life as normal so a lot of people, if they didn't leave the island, evacuated to either the central or the northern zone. And then in November, sorry, 1997, there were more 
fibroclastic flows that went to Plymouth. And then a major one happened and completely erupted. And actually what happened was the port, all of the ash went into the port. So the harbour got totally destroyed because the it basically built up the level of the harbour and so ships and boats couldn't get into it anymore. So lots of eruptions there. Now, when it erupted again in 1997, lots of people had thought it wasn't going to erupt. They'd seen it go, a huge amount come out in the previous sort of 18 months and they thought, that's it, it's over, it's had its eruption. And people who had evacuated started to come back to the island. And this is one of the problems is that people think with a volcano, it's over. But they never quite know and so when they think oh nothing's happened they get a bit complacent and they returned and that was part of the problem now unfortunately because of its area if you actually have a look in 1998 although there was sort of a bit more activity no major eruptions there was then a hurricane and that caused these lahas these mudslides which buried more of plymouth and then you can see that in the sort of late 90s early 2000s there was a little bit more eruption and actually, well, now it's really quiet again. It, it has the odd moment where they think it's going to erupt again, but it's gone fairly quiet. And recent, this only goes up to 2009, so it's 11 years ago, recent reports are actually saying that they believe that uh, the island now is potentially, or the volcano potentially could be um, dormant again. But watch this space. So again, what I want you to do is just to read through this and have a look and see what actually happened. It sort of goes into a little bit more detail of those first eruptions in the 19, 1995 um, and what happened subsequently. So we need to think about, OK, you've had these eruptions. Um, I think it was 30 something or maybe six something. I keep reading different figures. Uh, people died. So. Compared to some of the disasters with earthquakes where tens of thousands and in fact with the uh, Boxing Day Tsunami hundreds of thousand people and the same with Haiti died. Um, it was relatively low in terms of the number of people that died. And that tends to happen in volcanoes because you have um, you, you basically can get more warnings that a, vol a volcano is going to erupt. We need to start the responses. So we've got some evacuation, we've got the area of life in the north, we've got what was happening on the airport. So again, read through this information. The bit that you might feel very familiar, children could not go to school. There was no end in sight. Now, one of the things I want you to realise is that quite often, actually, how to respond can be really, really difficult because the people involved don't always understand each other. Now, what happens is you've got three groups of people involved. We've got the scientists, we've got the politicians, and then we've got the public. And actually, if you think about this, it's very similar to what's happening now. We have the scientific advice group, Sage, talk to us about what's happening with the pandemic. We have the politicians who take the advice, but they also need to think about what's best for the country. And then we have the public, who will hear the advice, but have to decide what decisions they're going to make. And this was the issue is that the scientists are going to interpret the data. They're going to maybe because they have to model it and they go, well, we think this might happen. And other scientists go, well, I think that might happen. The politicians, they get the advice and they go, oh, but is that the right thing? Do we evacuate? If we evacuate too soon, is it going to cause a problem? Are we going to have enough food, enough shelter? What are we going to do with everybody? And then the public go, am I prepared to take that risk? And they're the ones that have to make a decision in the end. So after the final evacuation, months passed, etc. And then this goes on to talk about the disaster striking in 1997. So it first erupted in 1995. As I said to you, it kind of went quiet. There we go. We've got the figure. It was 19 people were killed on that day alone. Um, and then they realised really probably the southern part of the island was lost to live on. So this is over to you now. I want you to think about how you would respond. Now, this is the activity that some of you may have done before, but I'm doing it slightly differently because obviously last time you were in groups and we had like a pretend sort of teams of what you had to do. 
So what I want you to do is I want you to think about how you would respond yourself to the Montserrat eruption if you were in charge. And what I've got is a Word document, which is in the attachments. And I want you to decide what you would do for each situation. When you've done it, there's another slide that will then tell you what a score would be for it. So this here, so event one. So the first thing that happens is that the dome on the eastern side of Chancellor's Peak is growing larger. And you have to decide whether you A, evacuate all sediments on the eastern side of the volcano. B, do you set up roadblocks at long ground to monitor the situation? Or C, do you send a helicopter to circle the crater and report back? Now, I've also attached a map so you can use the map as well to see where all these places are that they talk about. So if you decide that you're going to pick A, you literally just circle A. For two, lava, ash and rocks pour down the Tar River Valley, producing huge clouds of steam. So if you think you're going to pick C, watch and monitor the volcano carefully from a safe distance. You pick C and so on. So you just circle the ones that you want. So if you look at the map and you look at this risk assessment sheet, take your time, read it all carefully. Don't think oh, I've not picked B for a while. I better pick that. Read it through. And when you finish, come back to the PowerPoint to look what the answers should be. OK, so what I've done here is literally written down very briefly what those 10 events were on the left and then given the score. So I picked A for the first one, so I would give myself 10 points. I picked C for the second one, so that would be zero. And then you total up your score. The higher the score, the better it is that you will have dealt with the event. OK, so, for example, if you're getting zero, it means that there's a slight problem. If you've given yourself five, it means that actually it's something that you could be considering. So zero don't definitely want to do that. Five is maybe could consider it. And a 10 is, yep, that's exactly what you should be doing. And now I want you to write up from that activity, thinking about the responses. And I want you to think about what decisions did you make that were good for the island and its people? So the why did you give yourself a 10? And the ones that you got yourself 10, why are they good? Explain your answer. Which decisions did you get wrong? So any that you got zero, have a look and think what you should have put and spot what's wrong. What did you do and why might that not be a good idea? And then lastly, think about what you think is the hardest job when responding to a hazard. Why may it be harder or more challenging in a low income country? And then just bringing this towards the end, we want to think about what the area is like now. So what did they do? So think about the fact that the present day of how they're trying to rebuild a lot of things in the north, um, accepting that most of the south has gone. Um, if you look at the middle photograph in 2011, there's just no trace of the old airport. So they had to think about new um, transport routes for people as well. They reckon that the scientists generally behaved well. But there was some sort of friction between some of them, but most of them gave a calm and consistent message. And they basically made sure they educated the politicians and the government of Montserrat, they believed, handled the crisis well. And most of the people coped pretty well as well. They understood, the scientists managed to explain to them the reason behind it. The volcano erupted, this is what's happened. And so they're working to rebuild it. The issue was actually with the UK government and they believed they didn't respond well. People were able to evacuate and should have been able to come to live in the UK, but this is really quite important because it says that in the last paragraph, although Montserrat's a UK territory with a governor, a lot of them were not treated as if they were British citizens. The aid provided was minimal and often completely impractical. For example, they gave tents. Now tents might seem fine, but the island is exposed to very strong winds and those tents are not gonna stay up. Um, they delayed sending anything about the new infrastructure, the roads, the ports, the airports. So many of them lived for refugee, like refugees for years. And 
any that chose to emigrate were given such a small resettlement fund that they couldn't actually stay out of poverty. Um, and if they were moved to the UK, they were classed as refugees, not British citizens, and refugees cannot legally work. And that meant that they then couldn't increase their income at all. So they actually felt quite insulted. It's like they've been really proud of their British history and they felt that they were part of Britain. And then when they really needed the British government, unfortunately, they weren't given that help. So they, it caused quite a bit of conflict in that area. OK, so as always, the quiz. Now, what I've noticed with some of you is I've got a sneaky suspicion that some of you are whizzing through these PowerPoints and going, yep, done it, and then attempting the quiz. And as a result, getting lowest scores on the quiz. Not all of you, I'm seeing some fantastic scores. Um, I've tried to make it a bit easier this week. Um, last week, I must admit, trying to get things in the right order meant if you either got it, if you had know, one wrong, meant you've got everything wrong for the eight points. But just to be clear, what I actually do is I look at all your answers and I will keep track and I can see, and if necessary, I will adjust scores when I think, yes, you've got it. So for example, um, you had to name the two types of plate margins where you get volcanoes and you would only get the two marks if you named the two correct ones. So if you named one and got it correct, it didn't give you any marks. So I'm looking all the time and seeing what your answers are. And I have my own tracking sheet and I'm, I'm keeping score of that myself. So don't worry too much if you look and think to yourself your score. Do what you do now and email me and tell me if you think you've done something wrong and what you think the answer should be and I'll happily uh, check it as well. So this week it should be fairly straightforward. It all relates to the work we've been doing. Uh, one mark answers, uh, nothing to try and put into any orders, but you absolutely need to have this PowerPoint ready in which to do it. Okay, so good luck, enjoy doing it and see you next week.